and welcome to Game Changers with Vicki Abelson. That's me. And my guest tonight is Gregory Harrison. Gregory and Doobie. <laughs> there he is. Say hi, Doobie. Hi. Hey, so, Gregory, I was just asking you the question before we went live. Can you tell everybody why uh, he's named Doobie? He's named Doobie because he's a ragdoll cat. And when I got him as a little kitten, one of, I guess the reason I got him, I, that I chose him as a little kitten was because... I could drape him over any part of me around my shoulders and he was perfectly chill. And wow. it was like, I said, this cat, this cat smoked a doobie just before I met him. <laughs> so, and, but he's, he's like permanently in that, in that condition now. So he's, like a, he's the chillest cat in the world and I named him Doobie. I, I love the name. I love the drug. I loved the drug. It wasn't so good to me. We're going <laughs> to get to, uh, Gregory, how many years sober are you now? Oh gosh. Uh, 34, almost 34, 33 and three quarters. Okay, that is crazy to me. We're gonna talk about that story, but before we get to that story, I um, happen to know that somebody got their shot today or was supposed to. Yeah, somebody was supposed to, but somebody isn't 75 and somebody got turned away today. No, stop. Yeah, yeah, my wife and I both got turned away. We had an appointment, we'd had it for two weeks. They took the appointment. They knew our age in the appointment, but when we got there, they said, "No, no, no. I'm sorry, you can't do it. You got to be 75." Okay, first of all, that's wrong because they changed the law in California. So, mm. but you're not in LA. Well, I'm in Ventura County, right. and that may be different than LA County. So, it clearly is. I cannot believe they 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 gave you the appointment and turned you away. I can't believe this. Oh, I've I've actually heard that from many people up here, who are really you know just just be somewhere between 65 and 75 and they all got turned away but i've got a couple of friends in la who are younger and uh who are just over 65 and they got it two weeks ago i got mine a week ago uh mm -hmm. on on inauguration day but actually um good for you six hours online in dodger stadium six hours gregory wow wow <laughs> yeah. it was crazy but and and it was it, it, unlike the freezing cold today, it was 84 degrees and my car air conditioning wasn't working and I wouldn't roll down the windows. Oh, so it was oh, not yeah, right. a fun thing ever. Not fun, not fun. Wow. Uh, so, okay. So I'm thinking that the reason they turned you away is because there's a tremendous shortage of vaccines right now. So they mm. probably readjusted the age limit, but I'm guessing next week when Biden sends out the 1.5 million extra vaccines per week, you're going to be able to get your shot, I think. I hope, you know, I mean, we'll, we'll keep trying. And, you know, if they haven't, they haven't announced in uh, Ventura County when they're going to do that. You know, and I have a connection in LA County through UCLA Medical Center down there, which I, I've used over the years. And so I know they, they have sent out emails that they are giving them to 65 and over, which, I, which is my age range. So As is mine. we'll see, maybe I'll get it through that. Okay, so what I heard with that is because the day that I was online at Dodger Stadium for six hours, a friend of mine called me and went, hey, I just got an email from UCLA and they said, when do you want to come? 320, 340. Within one hour, he had gotten the email, gotten the shot and come home. And yeah. it, But it's because he's a cancer patient. So what the hospitals are doing is, yes, 65 and over, but cancer patients first and people mm -hmm. who have- Well, that makes sense. That yeah. makes sense, yeah. No, I, I thought I was going to get lucky and, and get one, but, you know, if, I, if, if they need to give them to more susceptible, you know, more, more vulnerable people first, that's, I'm good with that. You know, I just, I, I just want to be as far up in the line as I can legitimately be. Don't want to I think the secret is to be on the internet, you know, just be checking constantly because it'll be yeah. forever changing. And I do think you'll be able to get an appointment after next week when they up the, the amount of vaccines that are going out. Somebody, Tony just said, how is it possible that Gregory of all people can get upstaged by a cat? But uh, Doobie's quite gorgeous. <laughs> and uh, what, what a luxurious coat. Um, yeah, yeah, so, the best. And, and I love he's got a little, he's got a little goatee. Oh, he's got a little goatee there. Cute thing. Um, beautiful color too. Uh, so, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I do this other show since we went into lockdown uh, called Shooting the Shit with Vicky. And I did it to be of service during COVID. And I was going live actually seven days a week at the beginning and then five. And now I do four, but it's basically just to get us through 
uh, cause I'm yeah. alone, living alone. So I have, I lead what's called the COVID crazies. And so everybody's going to want to know what your COVID life has, what, what's your COVID life like? Like what's your level of um, comfort and how much in the world have you been? You know, I, I think I, I'm being as careful as, as you can possibly be for, for seven or eight months. I left the house uh, maybe, I mean, I didn't shop. Right. I didn't shop for groceries I ordered in. Me too. I, I don't think I, until I started working recently, you know, in the last couple of months, I wasn't inside of another building besides my own home for eight months. Okay, so how, after doing it that way and being so careful, Instacart, all that stuff, how do you go back to work without being crazy? How does that, how does that happen? Well, and this is General Hospital. I assume. is this General Hospital that you went General back to? Hospital, General Hospital first, and then right after I started shooting General Hospital a couple months ago, um, I got a, a recurring part in 911 playing uh, Jennifer Love Hewitt's father. Fantastic. D, D Wallace and I were playing mom and I, dad. I yeah. love, I'm, I, I've known D for years, so I um, love I, I figured you did. Yes. And Dee and I know each other. We did an episode, a very dramatic episode of Trapper John MD 42 years ago. Oh my God. So it was nice. It was a nice reunion between us. And uh, and we did wow. two episodes. We just finished last Friday. Wow. Um, we shot two. The second episode took, because it went through Christmas break and then the pushback for COVID again in the beginning of January, mm -hmm. it ended up taking like 46 days to shoot the last episode the second episode of ours okay so um, while the first on... one airs on february 8th and the oh. second one the following week yeah fantastic no, we were... it's right here so here while... we were... go ahead i'm he's sorry up. he's doobie's, Hi, doobie's doobie. making his departure <laughs> yeah. um while you were on set uh my son is now working for ncis from home but his roommate is working was working at goliath and there were covid episode was there, was there any COVID on set while you were there a couple of people tested positive over that period of time but we were tested uh six times in the two weeks prior to starting work right six separate tests right prior to starting work and then uh every other day on set tested uh not the rapid test but the 12 hour uh i think the, the more accurate 12 hour 12 to 24 hour test right. and they get those results back so that before you started work the next day, if you had tested positive, you could be stopped and isolated and anybody you had been around. When you're on set, you're working in bubbles, basically. You know, you you have the actors and your makeup people. Um, okay, now wait. Everybody's, so they, they everybody's have... masked. Everybody has face masks, has a face a shield, shield right. except the actors. The actors are masked right through rehearsal it was the weirdest thing it is the weirdest thing. i'm doing it on general hospital too we rehearse i'm working tomorrow i'm doing 20 pages on general hospital tomorrow wow and and uh i'll get in there we'll we'll block everything i will not see my co-actors faces until the camera is rolling and we're filming it and you know how soaps are you don't get a second take so <laughs> uh, i'm learning oh is that how you're going to do it you know on well, the actual take, I don't get any rehearsal where I see. I mean, we do a one, a one rehearsal kind of walkthrough blocking, you know, in the morning. I have no clue what they just did. I can't see a face. I can't even hear them half the time. They're muffled. They're not. So, oh God. I'm discovering their performance and they're discovering mine, on camera in front of the world. It's wow. the weirdest thing. Yeah. Wow. Oh, by the it way, it makes you. It makes you really listen though. And pay attention because you want to react, you want to be real, you want to respond right. <laughs> appropriately to whatever it is they're bringing, but you don't know what they're going to bring until it's like improv, you know. <laughs> this is hysterical. By the way, uh, Danny Paul said he loved being your dresser on Broadway. Danny oh. Paul, I love Danny Paul. We had the best time. It, yeah, he's a great guy. Is this Chicago? Was this when you did Chicago? Uh, no, I think Danny was. Steel Pier, if I remember. I think it was Steel Pier in the late 90s. Might have been Follies in 19 or 2001. But I think it was Steel Pier. 
Okay. But so Danny was my dresser for about six months. It was fantastic. He's great. He's Where great. And he's been, he's, he's sort of dropped into my Facebook family too. So I, I'm able to keep up with him. We are, we're, we're, I love that. We're going to talk about all your career stuff in a minute. I just want to just wrap with the, the I want to talk about COVID and I want, I want to talk a little politics with you before we move into fun things. Oh. Although, they're, although they're get, it's getting more fun though, Gregory, come on. The last time we saw each other, we, you know, it was the reign of the idiot and um, things were very dire. In fact, if it was four years ago, which you were saying, yeah, it's been about four years since I last did the show, I guess. I know for the first year after, after, you know, who was elected, I can't even say the name anymore, but after, you know, who was elected, I was in like a state of shock, you know, so I'm sure that uh, we conversed about it, but I, I have no memory of, of what I might have said. I just know that I just couldn't believe my eyes. And I, I still couldn't a month ago believe my eyes. And, and I'm just now starting to get, get a grip on the opportunity for real change and that there might be a glimmer of hope and some light at the end of the tunnel. I can use all these different metaphors, but it's, <laughs> it's like I'm able to sleep a little longer mm -hmm. and a little more calmly and better. I don't wake up with dread, you know, I wake up, uh, you know, feeling like I used to feel, you know, relatively hopeful, idealistic. It's a good world. I love, I love my life. Instead of waking up with oh, holy shit, what did the, what did that guy tweet off the off the crapper at, at four a.m. You know, and, was, which I terrifying. used to always wake up with. It was terrifying to turn on the TV to to, to put on CNN every single day. It was just every one day, of every day, just dread all the time. Yeah, and I still have dread. I mean, it's not like all the problems got solved. They didn't. You know, we have a right a really hard road ahead of us uh, to try and repair the damage and accomplish something positive that needed to be accomplished four years ago, you know, regarding the environment or just so many things, but, you know, immigration, all these different issues, but we've just been backing up for four years. So it's just so nice to feel like there's somebody in the White House that I can recognize having some of the qualities that I aspire to, you know, of a little dignity, a little, uh, 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 you know, concern and kindness, uh, uh, you know, uh, relative, you know, relative intelligent, relatively intelligent. It's like just somebody that I can relate to a little bit, you know, and. And isn't he presidential? He feels very. so presidential after what well, we've been through. You know, I think, I think we're seeing him in that light, maybe flavor. Yes, he's presidential. Yeah. But I don't think funny. he's. I don't think he's profoundly presidential. I, right. I just think he's a good guy. Yeah, I do too. For a change, we have somebody that, that, um, that won't that that isn't encouraging the worst aspects of us to, to, uh, to lead our nation. You know, and and it's, it's just a relief. It's just a By the way, you, you called it four years ago. You said four years ago that you foresaw as some of us did the the that this was not only going to impact us for four years that this was going to impact the world our world for generations to come actually what he did what he undid and how long it's going to take us to get to get back um but i i love that you have hope and i too i, I really believe i'm sleeping differently there's no absolutely no doubt about yeah. it yeah um, so, so how do but you, it's interesting, but it's interesting that for every one of us who's sleeping better, right? There's 74 million people who I guess are sleeping worse. And, and that really disturbs me. You know, the, the, the victory is sweet, but it's so slim that it's, it's bittersweet. You know, it's like, it's like, oh man, after four years of that behavior and that destruction, Still, almost half of the voters it, it's, wanted it's, to wanted to re up on that. It's terrible. I just, can't, I just don't understand it. I don't. Well, how do you feel about the forty five senators yesterday that voted in get against the trial for I mean, is how is that possible? There, I don't know. I don't know. I there's a different reality going. I can't just write them off and say they're just evil or they're just greedy and this is all about money. I don't think it is. I think they believe 
some of them, but not all, but some of them believe in what they're doing. They think they're doing the right thing. So oh, there's come a, on, the a no, I, I really think they do. I think there's a, a glitch, a, some kind of a of a of a computer glitch in the brains of people who 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 can support that that platform. Come on, Gregory. You don't think for for the senators, it's just in a polit a political agenda. I think the people that follow him, to some extent, but I, I think they also I think they look in the mirror and shave every morning. I think they sleep at night. I, I, they sleep at night. So, how does one do that if one knows that you're, you know, that you're the spawn of Satan? How do you do that? I don't know. I, do you do you have any hope that seventeen Republicans will will no. Stand up. You do, you don't think it's going to happen? No, that's okay. I, I still think he needed to be impeached again. Mm -hmm. I think we have to have all evidence down the road, and for for the future, not just for history, but more practically for what we do politically four years from now and eight years mm -hmm. from now. Is we have to say that is not uh, okay. That is not appropriate behavior. And you need to be condemned and roundly condemned, and maybe not punished. You know, maybe he won't. Maybe he'll slip away as he always has without punishment. But he needs to be condemned, and that's what a second uh, uh, impeachment does. It condemns him roundly. You well, know, and, you and and it puts it, it takes away the asterisk of of uh, you know he's one of three who's been impeached. He's the only one who's been impeached twice. And, mm -hmm. and especially in the same term, you know, a few months apart. Right. That bad. I mean, it's, it, that needs to go in the history books and it needs to set a precedent for this kind of behavior down the road. Cause this kind of behavior will happen again. Oh God, I hope, oh, please. I hope that that, no, he's, well, okay, so he's, a, he's a reflection of what's wrong with the country. He's not what's wrong with the country. Yeah, but he is a, he is an extreme example of what happens when what's wrong with the country gets a whole lot of power and what can happen, yeah. how dangerous oh, yeah. that can become. It's so do you, do you think he will rise again? Not him personally. No, mm -hmm. I don't think so. I, I think it's just a matter of age and uh, in, a, in a, I think his 15 minutes are up with a segment of society. And so that he won't have that huge following. He'll still have his ardent following, but I don't, I don't think it'll be virtually half the country anymore. I think it'll be that, that hardcore 30% that always loved him, no matter what he did, that he could have, that the one that he was right about, that he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and, and they'd still vote for him. You, they'll you they'll think, always be there for him. Do you think they'll start that third party? That he'll start that third party so that he can. I think he'll try. I know he'll start Trump News, and it'll it'll replace Fox and OAN and be be nothing but uh, lies, basically. And yeah. and uh, and and he'll he'll be very successful with that. You know, if you can get a third of the viewing audience on your channel, no matter what you're you're putting on it, uh, you're a big hit. You know, it's, you're gonna make a lot of money off of that. So he'll have that following and he'll be able to have that propaganda voice in everyone's ears. Um, you know, his, probably his children will try and step into his shoes. Well, Ivanka's running, wants to run down in, in Florida. Florida, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what do you, do, do you think there's any chance that Cuomo will be able to indict him in New York? Them you know, I, I, I would hope and, you know, my, I, I hope so, but they've, they've, they've kept it so close to the vest that I don't really know what they have. You know, while he was president and they were doing all their investigation in New York, uh, those are crimes he can't, he can't, he couldn't have pardoned himself for. Now it's too late for him to pardon Do you himself. believe in the pocket pardon, pardon? Do you think that he's pocket pardoned himself and his family? What is that? A par the pocket, pocket pardon? Par they can pocket pardon. So in other words, they can pardon themselves, their family, and not tell anybody. It can be under, it can be quiet. And oh, then I hadn't even heard that, that possibility. Yeah. Um, I and wouldn't then, put anything past yeah. him. That's a, mm -hmm. if that's a, if that is a real feasible possibility, sure. I, I, I think he could have done that.
it's something that can be done, whether or not he did it. I, I think, why would he not, since he could? And then what if he happens, could, yeah. Then he pulls it out if he needs can to. Can he pocket pardon his children and then pocket pardon yes. every, anybody, others? Anybody he wants, but but it's not going to help him in New York. If Cuomo goes after, not I don't think if, when Cuomo goes after him in New York, it won't help him in New York. For state, for state crimes. Exactly. Yeah. Won't yeah. help him. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like, aside from all this talk, you're hopeful. I am hopeful. I mean, I, I, I at least uh, the bleeding has stopped uh, oh. for the for the moment. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. If healing is beginning, but but the bleeding has stopped. You know, I was a medic in the army, so if you can stop the bleeding. Uh, stop that flow, then everybody has a chance, you know? Let's talk about that for a minute, because I seem to recall that you have Republican background. One of your family members was Republican. Your dad maybe was Republican? Yeah. But, but you were, were but, never- But not like this kind of Republican. No, no, no. I, yeah. But but you, where did you, because you're a tremendous activist, and, and I know you're an environmental activist, which already Biden's stepping in on that, thank God. Right. Um, where did your, I, I know that you were a conscientious objector, a non-religious conscience. Talk, talk to me about how that all started for you. When did you become politically aware? Um, <clears throat> well, you know, I mean, when you're, when you're my age, I was born in 1950. So I was 13 years old when Kennedy got assassinated. Mm -hmm. And um, John Kennedy, John F. K. Uh, JFK, mm -hmm. got assassinated, and then I was uh, 18 when when Bobby and Martin Luther King were were assassinated. All mm -hmm. those things, you know that. And the the Vietnam War was going on, and pro, pro, protest was beginning with the Vietnam War and starting to rev up, and the war was revving up at the same time. And that was, of course, down the road in my future. So it was really hard to to like, I mean, we didn't have uh, video games to focus on or, or social media. It was really hard to not be aware mm -hmm. of world affairs mm -hmm. and the implications of what, how they might affect my life. So I think I did start to, I plus my mother, my mother was a Democrat. And uh, I remember coming home when John F. Kennedy was assassinated from school that day, 13 years old. And all I could hear was, wailing and I opened the door and, the, and there was just wailing in the house and all the lights were off. My mother was on the kitchen floor crying with her head down to the floor. And, uh, and that went on for, for days, you know. My um, mother as well, and my mother was a Republican, but my mother also wailed when Kennedy was assassinated. Um, yeah. So, but, but that, that kind of thing stimulates your thinking about, about politics and, and, uh, you know how it how it manifests in in the world of, of your own personal little world and the big world. You know, so I've always been kind of aware and been attentive to the news. And then I got drafted in in 1969. And okay, so uh, wait, let's talk about that because you were were you the first year of the lottery? You were at the lottery, right? No, the, I think 68 was the first year. I wasn't the first year. I was the second year, maybe third. But you, but was, you, did, you did get a low number. You, you, oh, yeah. I had like 32, I think, was my number. Yeah. Everybody I, I up to like one. Every, everybody up to 150 was getting drafted. So I can't even imagine the terror when you heard your number. I can't even imagine. So I what's your It wasn't thought? terror. I didn't really, really. No, it wasn't. I mean, because I've been raised to, you know, my father commanded a minesweeper in World War II for you know, it was in the Philippines and it was, it was just sort of expected, you know, I had some, some friends that were older than me in my little town of Avalon who'd gone to the war. A couple of them ended up dying that year. Um, it was just sort of expected. So part of me, you know, was living with the sort of Republican, uh, all American attitude around town my little town and part of me my sister was up was two years older she was up at uc santa cruz and she was she became like a hate ashbury hippie you know really really smart and really aware 
And she she literally was a Haight Ashbury hippie in 1967. And I went uh -huh. up to see her. I went up to see her. Remember, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, it was it it was it was a different world. And I and I had great respect for my sister's thinking. Always did. Grew up grew up in awe of her. Still pretty much am in awe of her. Yeah, she, she she's one of the world's great ethnobotanists. And uh, wow. Yeah, she and her husband wrote the book on psilocybin, and uh, wow, and, uh, she's one of the foremost authorities in the world on it. And uh, I enjoyed yeah. it very much back in the day. <laughs> oh, so did I. But uh, no, she she I really respected her, and she was she was very clear as an eighteen year old when I was a sixteen year old. She was very clear about her feelings on the war and that influenced me of course mm -hmm. that made me open my eyes and and explore it and then when i got when i got drafted i got my draft notice and i i had already done some thinking obviously so i knew i didn't want to kill anybody that's all i knew i didn't want to kill anybody and what was that based on because i from what i recall you were i think that the first non religious conscientious objection. yeah i mean I, I i had been raised mormon and i left it when i was about 13 14 years old and and i hadn't ever, and i had i had tried protestant protestant church and community church and and christian science and i i just finally by the time i was 18 i had given up on it and just sort of went okay you're agnostic um maybe okay. atheist but at least agnostic uh -huh. and uh and so I didn't have a religion and I was perfectly comfortable with that, not ashamed or anything. And then when I got in the army, I was drafted and I, I said, I didn't want to kill anyone. I knew that. So I, I, I found there was a, I could do the alternative. I could go in for three years instead of be drafted for two, enlist for three and become a medic. And I thought, ah, there, honorable. I'm not running away. I'm not hiding. I'm not lying but I don't have to carry a gun and all I'll do is make people well. I can live with that, uh, you know, because uh -huh. I was more afraid, I was more afraid of living with having killed than I was with dying. Wow. Especially not being religious. It was like, when you're dead, you're dead. So, uh, you know, if I'm dead, I'm dead. But if I'm alive, how do I live with myself? That was more important to me, still right. is. Mm -hmm. And so I, I went, aha, there's, there's an alley for me to slip into. I'll be a medic. I'll give them an extra year so I can choose it. I'll be a medic mm -hmm. and I'll get through it. You know, and none of the rest of it scared me. I figured, okay, you'll be sent to Vietnam, but you'll never have to, never have to carry a weapon. And who knows what kind of medic I'd be. You know, I might be in a hospital. I might be, you know, in, in a mass unit. I might be in a helicopter. I might be a you know, I'm, I might be in a hospital back in the States. Who knows where I'd be? You just signed up to be a medic and they're, they assure you that'll be the case. Well, I got in and I realized, oh, this is very different. Without the medics, the army doesn't work. If the army works, it's only because, it's not only, but it's partly because they have medics. That makes me just as guilty for this violence that's, that I don't agree with being imparted on this country that I don't know anything about and I know they're not threatening us. As as I'm as I'm as much a part of the weapon as the rifle barrel or the trigger or the stock. I, just because I'm not the bullet doesn't right. mean that I'm not just as guilty, equally guilty for what's going on. Wow. And that and that really bothered me in the army. Like, you know, I they wanted me to growl in the sand pits and stuff. And I was like, why? Because you're an animal when you're in sand pits. You, you're not a human being. You're an animal and you'll kill when you're and then just like, no, I'm not gonna do that. What? You know, I mean, this is in boot camp. So I'm getting, I'm getting, you know, and I'm passing the test with the highest scores in my entire company. Wow. PT school, you know, physical training scores, and and I'm an expert marksman on the on the rifle range and all this, but I'm refusing to do certain things. And I'm just getting a load of crap about it. And and I finally heard, oh, what you, you must be a conscientious objector. What's that? Oh, it's somebody who doesn't believe in violence and you know, religiously opposed. Oh, no, I'm I'm a conscientious objector, but I'm not religiously opposed. 
because uh, I have no religion. I'm just morally opposed. Well, they all laughed at that. And when I tried to register as a CEO in the army so that people would quit giving me crap about refusing to drive a truck filled with hand grenades or whatever it was that I would refuse, you know, they all laughed at me. So they just laughed me out of the room because it had wow. never been done. Wow. And no, no one had ever successfully been classified a conscientious objector with no religious grounds. Wow. You know, Seventh-day Adventist, Jehovah's Witness, Quaker. Right, uh, we those, also those... have a ridge. He, I don't even remember what he was. Right, right. right. Yeah. I believe he was a Quaker. I believe right. he was. Uh -huh. um, well, you know, and then I went, ended up, I got through boot camp somehow, got to medic training in, in Fort Sam, Houston, San Antonio, Texas, and started filing and started researching in my little spare time. Right. And, uh, and, and people quit laughing and the army started to get pissed. And so oh. they, they sent me to Germany. There were some, some articles being written in the army times. Mm -hmm. People were coming to interview me saying, you know, this is, this is very rare. No one's ever done this. And it, but they've been arguing about it since the writing of the constitution, but no one's ever successfully done this. Why are wow. you doing this? And I just went, I just am doing it. That's who I am. And I'm just trying to reflect who I am and do what I need to do. You know, I'm not trying to get out of service. I'm not trying to get even out of risk. I'm just trying to represent myself honestly and faithfully to who I really am and what I can really live with. Wow. And then, so I got sent to Germany. Mm -hmm. I didn't, they couldn't, because my case was in litigation, they couldn't send me to a combat zone. So they sent me to Germany. So I never went to Vietnam. They sent me to the out of the country to get away from these newspaper interviews and this sort of building uh, within the within our little circle of the army with the, this sort of building recognition. Check, Gregory, was the press on your side? Were you getting no. sympathetic press? No, you no, weren't. They weren't. They weren't against me. They, I, I don't ever recall anybody being against me or for me. They were just okay. mm -hmm. this is unique and we're reporting on it. Okay. Well, it wasn't a lot of people. It was just a couple times, but it caused a ripple mm -hmm. and you know the army didn't want the pentagon didn't want any ripples mm -hmm. and this this i think they were seeing i, I certainly wasn't the only one mm -hmm. you know I'm, I'm sure they've dealt with they've dealt with it for ever but this was a time where it was you could you could sense that this was an argument that others would follow up with right you know there was there was a, an awakening going on in the country Mm -hmm. especially with young people mm -hmm. and so they sent me to germany and figured okay it'll all just sort of fade away over there and we, we won't have to deal with it well i got to germany and i kept kept applying and kept trying to convince psychologists chaplains all these different people which i had to do in order to get through the through the to, to fill out the form you need approvals at all levels and i was in usurar united states army europe and I ended up doing review boards in front of generals. I mean, you know, with a microphone in front of me and 30 colonels, uh, lieutenant colonels and generals throwing questions at me. If you were walking down the street and a black man attacked you and your mother and tried to rape her, what would you do? You know, and if I'd said, Holy I do anything to go, well, then you're damn crazy. You know, you just you, you, put you in psychiatric ward. Or if I said I'd stop him, or I'd try to. And well, then you're certainly nonviolent. Get out of here. There's no, there's no good answer. So wow. you know, I'd, have to, I'd have to say, well, that's a hypothetical question, and I can't answer that. I, but I can only tell you what I've done in similar situations and how I would hope I would would behave. But I can't tell you what I would do because I don't know what I would do. It's mm -hmm. hypothetical. I don't have an answer. And that would be the only way that I could get around it. But it's like a, you're guilty no matter what kind of question. And right. <clears throat> so I went through that and through that. And I, I finally, after, in the meantime, I was flying, hel you know, in helicopter, not flying, hel we were flying in helicopters, mm -hmm. doing missions. You know, a lot of people get hurt, even in, in Germany. You really? know, a lot of a lot of soldiers and soldiers' dependents, uh, wives and children, you know, have accidents or whatever. And I fly around and take care of people and, and uh, you know, be a medic. Now, what qualifies and, you to be a medic, Gregory? You didn't have 
medical schooling to do that? How did, what qualified? That's, that's how, what they train you for at, at uh, Fort Sam Houston, Texas. It's medic, medical school, med school, medic school. And, and it's about a three, three and a half month program. And you learn how to, you know, stop the bleeding, uh, you know, how to, how to do CPR and CPR has changed a lot from those days, but it's always, you know, some form of CPR and uh, how to, how to uh, do amputations and, you know, preparing you for war, for warfare. Well, yeah, I mean, because limbs get damaged and you have to amputate on the, in the field, Holy. you know, that's, that's war. So they train you to do anything that you might have to do in war, you know, and you, and, and we, you know, I, in Germany, I was, <laughs> we did everything from, from inoculations to checking the hookers down at 20 Mark Strasse for, for, uh, you know, to make sure that they didn't have, uh, uh, different diseases that the soldiers were going to bring back you know so they would they assign you to do all these different things you know and, and there's medical needs that are simplistic but not the complicated ones they had we had real doctors in the army as well but we had all these medics that that uh, you know had limited duties and mine was in a helicopter so everything i did was you know i was vibrating like this the whole time in a helicopter trying to put an iv in or whatever it was you know. now uh, you know, uh, uh uh1ds we flew we flew in i seem to recall that they punished you were you in solitary or something like that did they say, yeah okay so tell us yeah. a little bit about For that about a year and a half i um, they, they, they considered me, uh, a risk because I, 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 I was contagious with this bad thinking. And so I was isolated in a, what they called a, it was, it was like a, in the bottom of an old Nazi barracks that had been taken over by the U S army oh my God. Um, years, years earlier in Lundstuhl, Germany. Um, they had me down in this room where they used to keep these decoding machines. So it had a metal door, a wooden door, and these big, thick rock walls, and it was underground, and just just a little window with three bars on it that was at ground level, okay. up at the top of the room, and that was my room, the old, uh, the old uh, decoder room, wow. so that I and I wasn't allowed to mingle with any of the other soldiers other than during the eight hours that I was up flying or doing missions. And uh, and that way I wouldn't infect anyone. That's what that was their thinking. How did that impact your your mental health? Well, it, it it was tough. I mean, it was all hard. It was all really hard. You know, I, I actually attempted suicide at one point. So it was, you know, I, I it was really hard. It was the hardest thing that I'd ever gone through, and then still the hardest thing that I've ever gone through. So now, um, this but this but true. having survived it. Uh -huh. eventually and and uh and having not only survived but having won um i got out of the army i i got out of the army f four months before i turned 21 mm -hmm. <laughs> having gone through a test that prepared me for the rest of my life but particularly prepared me for the competitiveness uh, of hollywood you know of I mean, people would come to me from my little hometown when I got out of the army and they'd say, yeah, I don't know, Hollywood, man, you know, the odds in Hollywood, those are bad odds, man. I'd say, you know, odds don't really bother me anymore. <laughs> I, my play. odds were so bad in the army. Yeah. And somehow I not only survived it, but I actually changed an army regulation. So we're, we're going to talk about the, the hometown and we're, we're going to talk about the career, but just a quick, because everybody on the thread is asking, did being a medic prepare you to be Trapper Dawn? I mean, did that did it did it help you when you were preparing for that role? Well, it probably did. I'm not in a way that, that I mean, I, I certainly didn't learn any bedside manner or any of those things that my character, you know, had to be pretty good at in Trapper John. But I've never been intimidated by medicine or doctors mm -hmm. since I was in the army. And I think lack you know not being intimidated by medical terms or medical processes uh, helped me a lot to to be convincing 
in a, you know, working over a surgical field or throwing orders around in the hospital and those kind of things. Yeah, I think it helped. But I don't know that it was something that I, I, I wouldn't have been able to do the part without it. I, I you know, I think, I think uh, I know enough to be dangerous. That's all. <laughs> Um, by the way, Gary Collins has keeps ask keeps mentioning that Pernell Roberts. Uh, this is the 11th anniversary of his passing, I guess today, um, and he's mentioned it a few times. So I wanted to oh. be sure to say something. But um, he was he's also asking if you studied medical journals or anything while you were doing Trapper John. Did you? Did that? I. I, I um, we didn't really, but we had technical advisors on the show. I remember we did an episode about uh, an artificial heart. I'm blanking on the gentleman, the doctor's name, who invented uh, invented the heart. I and know, he, I know this. Wait, oh, he came to the set and spent the week with us. And wow. Purnell and I, Purnell and I were doing performing this heart surgery with with his artificial heart in the show, and of course oh showing the heart. And we had him as our advisor, and he didn't. He did. He had invented the heart and did the first surgeries with it. And it wasn't the 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 heart surgeon in uh, in South Africa who got famous for William for artificial Johan Hoff, not him. Who? It says here. Oh, Jervik. 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 Right? Yes. Yes. That's who it was. And he spent the week on the set with us. Wow. And and he was he was brilliant. <laughs> and the, the best part, the funniest, the funnest part of the week was that here was this brilliant guy and, and it was, I just couldn't talk to him enough about medicine and, and milk him for every bit of information and experience he wanted to share. And all he wanted to know about were, did I know beautiful actresses and would I introduce them? <laughs> <laughs> when I introduced him to some beautiful chicks. Oh and, my God, uh, that's hysterical. <laughs> and I did, and I did. Oh, okay, so let's talk about that for a little bit because uh, the story of how you met your wife. So married 40 years, married yeah. 40 years, four, four children, a grandchild, another one on the way, total family man. Um, how'd you meet your wife? How'd you meet Randy? It's a great story. I met Randy uh, on, I, I literally had never seen her before. I met her on the Battle of the Network Stars. <laughs> at, at, we shot it at Pepperdine. That's where they always shot them. Uh -huh. And uh, and uh, she was representing NBC and, and Chips. And I was representing Trapper John and CBS. So they had this thing where ABC, CBC, CBS and NBC would, would each field a team of about 10, 12 people Mm -hmm. And you would compete in these various events. And one of the events was this water tank. It's like a circus thing, like a carnival thing, a water tank. And yet somebody, you, you know, the person would be saying, okay, it's uh, Gregory, it's your turn. Who do you want to sit above the water tank? Oh, I want that Randy Oaks, that girl in the, that girl <laughs> in the spandex, in that thin spandex bikini. I want her to go up there. It was Howard Cosell going, well, Randa Root, come on up and sit over the water. And she was the sassiest thing and she looked so beautiful, dry. And then I, <laughs> I, I put her, you know, she got up over this thing and, and they give you three softballs and you throw up this little target. And if you hit it, hits the arm and the thing drops and she gets wet. And the water was really cold. So, <laughs> So I, threw, so I threw and hit it the first time, bam, into the water she goes, <clears throat> squealing, laughing, challenging me, throwing crap at me. She gets back up there, bam, I hit it again. She goes back in the water. She gets back up there, bam, I hit it again. She, gets, she goes in the water. Now I walk around, I'm, I'm done. I've knocked her in three out of three. Oh, one, one, the thing, you know, and, and go around, I go up the stairs to where she had gone to get into the tank and I pick her up out of the tank, soaking wet in this spandex suit, cold as can be. You just have never seen anything quite so sexy. And at least I certainly hadn't and carried her back and set her down with her team. Well, then it's the next team's turn to pick. Right. She picks me. And I get up over the tank and she knocks me in three times. Oh, come on. She hit you. For real. It's on, it's on YouTube. You want to go look? Wow. And she picks me up at the end and puts me in her arms and carries me and puts me down on my bench. 
with my team. Wow. She was wow. really tough and really athletic and just gorgeous. And I mean, I was there with a girl who, who uh, broke up with me about a week later and she was there with a guy who was her fiance. She was, she had set a date and about a month later, and I know we let it go. And it was like, okay, that was just you guys, amazing. You guys didn't, didn't. No, didn't exchange numbers or anything. Okay. That was it. Mm -hmm. About a month later, I'm at some so charity softball game. My girl is broken up with me and I'm just like thinking, and it's the end of the world. And I'm sitting there on the, in the dugout of this softball game, sort of waiting for the game to start. People are out there throwing the ball around and warming up and I'm just sitting there kind of morose. And I hear this cluck, 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 cluck. Somebody's walking down the dugout uh, toward me and boom, sits down next to me. And I hear this voice saying, hi, two drinks and dinner and I'm yours. And I turn and look and it's Randy from the Battle of the Network Stars. Oh and uh, and that was guy. it. I bought her one drink and took her home. That's a great, and 40 years later. And 40 years later, we're still together. And uh, and she became, I mean, first she was just like an aspirin for my broken heart headache. And before I knew it, somebody asked me about three months, four or five months later, we were, you know, somebody you, you talk about, well, how many good friends do you have? Who's your best friend? And somebody said that to me and it was like an epiphany for me. I went, well, and I was gonna name three or four of my buddies. Mm -hmm. And I went, Randy, Randy Oaks, my best friend. And it was like, wham, with a sledgehammer upside the head, you know? Wow. That, oh my God, she is. And I, I think that's why, that's why I felt, I mean, I, it wasn't out of mad passion. It was out of friendship. And there was passion there too, but it was mostly just about friendship. And we, we hadn't had no expectations when we started and it was like, it, it allowed room, it allowed the air and the water for the, for the plant to grow, you know, in a healthy way and not choke itself off with pressure and, 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 uh, and, and being too self-conscious about itself. This was like, we just had this relationship and we got married a year after the Battle of the Network Stars. We got married and it's been 40 years. It's a great, it's a great love story. As I would only imagine, okay, I'm playing devil's advocate here. I don't know the answer to this. We haven't discussed it before, but because of who you are, how you look, your charm, the way you are, has it, I would only, I can only imagine that there's been challenges with being uh, in a married man through this incredible career and life you've led. And especially because at the beginning, when you were with Randy, you were still using. So how the hell have you kept it together all this time? Well, what's well, the secret to your success, both of you, do you think? Well, I think the reason that we, we hit it off so well in the first place, besides the immediate lust of looking at each other at the battle, was why we became friends and why we are still friends is because we have values that are pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. And we run our life by those values. They're more important than anything else, anything. And uh, so no matter what I did with my drug abuse or, you know, no matter what kind of things happened and there have been challenges, mm -hmm. Randy always believed that at the bottom of who I really am was the man she wanted to be spending her life with. Mm -hmm. And I really believed that about her. So even when I can't stand her, <laughs> I know that I love her and she's the best thing for me mm -hmm. and, and I can't do better, you know? So it's like, I can walk away. She'll give me room walk away. Cause she trusts, she trusts that about me that I appreciate her as much as she appreciates me. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have to run and battle each other or defend or do anything. We can allow each other to walk away and disgust and know they're coming back mm -hmm. and they're going to come back reasonable and looking for solutions, looking for positivity wow. and not, and not just to strike back. We don't ever strike back. 
And one of the things about raising our kids is successfully has been that they've, they've only seen a functional parenting. They've, they've never seen, we've never fought in front of our children. Wow. And we never, we don't really fight. We mm -hmm. debate. Mm -hmm. um, but we talk, you know, we talk about if, if, if she's hurt my feelings, we talk about that. Mm -hmm. If, if I think that she's wrong, we'll talk about that, but I, we won't, we won't stab each other or ever hurt each other. We, we, we're, we're in it to find solutions only, you know? that. but that's pretty much the way I've lived my life and the way she lives her life. So it's just a reflection. Our relationship is a reflection of who I think we are independent of each other. That's beautiful. And, and that's very recovery based, which uh, let's get to that for a moment. Uh, you said that your children have never seen you. Uh, how many years are you, are you sober, Gregory? Uh, 34. Wow. Okay. So your drug of choice was okay. Okay. Cocaine. So now you were a child of the sixties. Did you, were you smoking pot and doing all that stuff? And were you, were you an addict when you were young? Did you get high in the army? I mean, what was, um, <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think I was an addict. Um, I mean, did start drinking young, but I, I grew up on Catalina Island and everybody, every time I'd look at, at people that came over from the mainland, which is most of the examples we had, mm -hmm. there's only, you know, I had 16 guys in my class, 15 girls, 31 wow. of us that I graduated with, 28 of them I went to kindergarten with. The only examples we had for what real life must be like was the people who came from the mainland, mm -hmm. tourists for, for a weekend. And I thought they were just doing what they always did. I didn't know that they were going there to do what they couldn't do or wouldn't do at home. <laughs> so they were being idiots on our island and then going back to some kind of sanity on the mainland. And that was, that was beyond, I didn't understand that. So at about 11, I started drinking, having sex, uh, smoking well, 11? Dope. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, okay, I'll be honest. Um, I was molested at the age of nine by a guy. Um, so sorry. That was, well, uh, it's not unusual, you know? Mm -hmm. That was uh, that was one of those things that drove me for, to my first compulsion, which was sexual, which, which was, how do I prove I'm not gay? As a nine-year-old in a town, a Republican town in 1959, that was like the worst thing I could imagine being accused of. Did you tell anybody what happened? No, nobody knew. No, no, no. I never told anyone. Mm -hmm. I never, never told anyone. My parents never knew. Um, but I, so I spent the next uh, nine years proving I was uh, not gay mm -hmm. with numerous, innumerable tourist girls. And that was my, that was my, you know, only uh, usually the people who abuse have been abused. That was my abuse of people because of the way I'd been abused. Right. Mm -hmm. It was the, it was one thing led to the other. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't like an abuser in that I, I intentionally went out to hurt people, but I, I, I abused hearts, you know, I, I didn't really care about the person. All I cared about was the was proving something to myself, you know, and to, and to others. And just, I was just in such fear of, of being gay. Mm -hmm. And, and not that I'd ever felt like I was gay. It's just this guy picked me to abuse, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so I, I, uh, that was my first compulsion. And once I was in the army and I started to figure it all out and I started to make peace with things. Um, and then I came to Hollywood, you know, I totally, I mean, I am, I embraced people, whether they were gay or straight and I always did. It ended up that my Catalina productions, I was the only straight guy there mm -hmm. <clears throat> out of eight employees, eight, eight people running the company. I was the only straight one mm -hmm. and I was perfectly fine with that. Mm -hmm. You know, but it took a lot of self-work to get to that point, you know, to get to that security, lack of judgment, 
you know, all that. So that was my first compulsion. And I was doing a lot of drinking in high school, smoking pot, screwing around, literally and figuratively. And, um, but I wasn't an addict. I wasn't an alcoholic. Okay. Never much enjoyed it. I never much enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, and I never, and it never really, I mean, I, you know, I was, you know, I was, I was a, a, a really good athlete. I was the president of the student body. I got fine grades. I was leading all the school plays. I did all that stuff, but I was also, uh, also had a dark side, you know, that, that dark side of, of, I'd go to the Lions Club meeting to represent the school and I'd be sitting next to guys whose daughters I had nailed. Yeah, God. Who would be saying, I hope my daughter marries someone like you. So I was an actor even back then, apparently, <laughs> you know? But, but uh, you know, it's all part of growing up. And, and, uh, and then I ended up, when I, the, I never had a problem with alcohol. I couldn't afford any of it. <clears throat> in the army or out of the army. Wait a minute, cocaine was more expensive than alcohol back in those days. Cocaine was God's way of telling you you make too damn much money. That's what Robin Williams <laughs> said. Robin Williams said that and he was right. Yeah. And I didn't become a cocaine addict until my second season of Trapper John MD. When you're making $50,000 an episode and all of a sudden, you know, you have all these friends who now friends, quote unquote, who now are saying, hey, I got this great connection. Let's let's go party. And and uh, can you? Yeah, come, come on over. Let, let's buy a few a few grams from him and, and we'll just, uh, you know, we'll go do this. We'll go do that. It was like, OK, sure. I got more money than I ever imagined having. Mm -hmm. And uh, and nine years later, you know, I'm crawling on my knees into Betty Ford. Okay, before we get to having Betty put Ford, a million dollars up my nose. Oh God! While you're putting that million dollars up your nose, you're you're the star of a huge television show. Does mm -hmm. your drug abuse get in your way? Does it does it mess you? Are, are you responsible? Are you irresponsible? How, how does that play out? Response: I'm irresponsible, but I, I I pass that off on other people. I always blamed others, as uh -huh. one is wont to do when one's an addict. Mm -hmm. It was never my fault. Very Trumpian of me, don't you think? Um, <laughs> it was never oh, my fault. Right. Um, you know, so... And, so and, but obviously you got away with it, though. No, it didn't. I, 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 my creativity, in my, in my prime time, I sabotaged my creative juices for the four or five years of the prime of my career. Wow. You know, so... Uh, it, if I have a regret in my life, that would be it. Just that I, you know, I, I allowed this thing. I'm, I wandered into this area of life, this addiction, and and had no idea what I was, what I was, the trap I was walking into, and how long it would, and how hard it would be to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And at the moment of my most potential, uh, I went creatively dormant the best i could do was hang on to a career not not grow one did anybody notice that other than did anybody notice that yeah i had a, i had a business partner and and a wife and uh, friends and yeah they all did but it i was i was different. an addict and i was i ended up isolating in my mm -hmm. addiction mm -hmm. so and lying to them all so, you know, I was too proud and embarrassed to admit to any of them that I'd lost control of my life. And, and it took me years to finally get desperate and humble enough to reach out and get some help, to what admit that I needed help and surrender. What got you to surrender, Gregor? Because everybody has their moment. It might not be a low bottom. You know, it's, it's, it wasn't being impotent. It wasn't my career uh, collapsing. It wasn't my friendships all falling apart. It wasn't me being a complete unprofessional on the set. It, mm -hmm. it, and it wasn't me uh, being anemic and, and knowing that I could, I could not wake up any morning now because I was, I was pushing the envelope so hard. It wasn't any of those things. 
they probably contributed, but those things alone didn't do it. What did it was Emma Lee Harrison, my one-year-old daughter, uh, one morning I, I woke up in my office having passed out on the couch at 6 a.m. and slept for 14 hours. So I don't know what day, what time of day it was, but I, I came out of there to the to discover Randy and my one-year-old daughter in in the living room. And I reached for her and she came running to me and we cuddled for a few minutes and I set her down and went back to my office and did my first little bump of the day, mm -hmm. just a little, and came back out and reached for her again and she ran from me. Wow. So she knew when I was high and when wow. I wasn't. Wow. It was, totally, it was totally a vibe. It was wow. my vibe that drove her away. Wow. And that, I, I, there, for some reason, that was my bottom. Wow. Yeah. And so you made the call, you went to Betty Ford, but that kind made of the call, had to wait three weeks. I did the world's greatest uh, uh, goodbye party with drugs <laughs> for three solid weeks, more drugs than in three weeks than I'd probably done in the previous two years wow. as an adios, I guess, to them. I did them all the way out in the car, all the way to to the front door at Rancho Mirage <laughs> and finished off my last gram bottle of Coke at the front door. And I knew when I walked in the door that that was the last time I was ever gonna use drugs. Was that the last time you ever used drugs? That was the last time I ever used drugs. Fantastical. We <laughs> walked in that in the next the next day, they set us all, as 80 of us, 80 beds, they set, they set us all down on in chairs in this room and this, this priest who worked with Betty Ford came up and he, I'm gonna drop an F-bomb here. He came up and he said, he said, uh, I can't guarantee that none of you will use again, but I can guarantee we're gonna fuck it up for you for the rest of your life. <laughs> That's funny. And he was, and he was right. Yes, it, the, it, it ruins for bad behavior, if recovery does. It, it was like I could never use again without knowing that I was putting the gun to my head. Yeah. And that was all I needed to know. It, that, that put me over it. Plus nine years of, of being out of control, sitting in the back seat of my life, watching someone else that looked like me drive the car into hell, you know? So, I mean, I, I was ready to, was ready to, to get sober. But did your wife ever ask you to? Did it get in the way of your marriage? I mean, how can you be horribly in the way of our marriage? Yeah, how she how she survived that with me, I have no idea. But she's not well, she never asked you to to get to get of course she did. She did. But I lied and told her I wasn't an addict. I see. How dare you call me an addict? Mm -hmm. If you were a better wife, I probably wouldn't be impotent. Oh, and I did every lie in the book. No, it's that's 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 addictive behavior. And yes, I'm, I've been there, been there, done that. I you know, you know. Yeah. So it's, I, it's, I, it's, I mean, I've had to make I've been making 40 years of amends to people and I'll continue. You know. Uh, do you, did I, I seem to recall something happened when you were at Betty Ford that kind of backfired on you? Oh, yeah, it was just that, uh, you know, you, you, the hardest part of going into rehab for me with my huge ego mm -hmm. was admitting to anyone where I was going. You know, I was hoping I could get in there, do my 30 days, get sober, come out, and then it's gone, it's behind me, and I don't ever have to have to, have to explain it or, or, or admit it. It's just like, oh, then life is back to normal and I'm, I'm good. Mm -hmm. It was absurd, but that's what my hope was. Right. And I get in there and at the end of the first week, uh, you know, they allow guests to come in on the weekends and you sign these, these uh, non-disclosure agreements at the front door before you go inside to visit the person you're there for and all that. At the end of the first week, the, at the time, the only thing there was in Hollywood was, was the Inquirer. 
you know, there was no TMZ or, or anything. There was no television shows. There was, there was the Inquirer. And if you were right. in the Inquirer, you were exposed, you know? And the Inquirer made up a lot of lies, but they would also expose all the juicy truths. I was on the cover of the Inquirer oh. at the end of my first week. Oh. Gregory Harrison in, in rehab. Here's what he admitted in, in his uh, group therapy. Uh, oh. Somebody in my group therapy, my eight people in my group therapy, had talked to their visitor and told them what I had said in, in tears and in abject pain and, and trust I had admitted to in my therapy with this small group. You know, they divide you into 10 groups of eight. And, um, and I got totally exposed you know, and, and all my dirty secrets. And, you know, for at first it was, you know, for the next three weeks before I got out, it was like, oh man, I can't believe that happened. I can't believe that happened. How, what's how the world, what's go the world going to be? How no, are I'm, you able to go back into that therapy? How are you able to continue your, your program with that? Uh, did I don't you? remember. I don't remember exactly how it got settled out, but somehow we kept going. I think I knew that my my sobriety now, by that time, at the end of the first week even, I knew my sobriety was more important than my ego. And you compartmentalize. And that's something I'll have to handle when I get out of here. But in wow. here, in here, you've begun. It's already done. You've already been exposed. Let's get what this has to offer you. And then we'll deal with that when you get out. What I didn't know was that when I got out, mm -hmm. you know, after 30 days, I've never had to tell a lie or even a lie of omission since then. Because if anybody came to me or walked by me and said, hey man, how are you? I didn't have to say, oh, I'm good. Hey, everything's fine. Oh, you know, I had a great vacation in Spain or you know, wherever I was gonna make up a lie about where I was or pretend that I'm not an addict. No, no, I was just, uh, you know, I just needed to go get healthy. Well, you look pretty, you look a lot better. Why is that? No, I just, uh, you know, just, I didn't have to make any lies. Somebody said, how are you? I'd say, you know, I'm doing okay today. Thank you. I'm doing pretty good. One day at a time, you know? And I've never lied since. I've never told a lie in 34 years. And it's, wow. it's like that whole, because, because that was my addiction, was deception mm -hmm. and, and hiding from responsibility and, and blame and you know blaming others all the, it's like i i don't ever any if if i do any of those things i feel like i might i might as well have just done a, a an ounce of cocaine because it, it feels exactly like i'm back in my disease so i don't do them wow did the person who perpetuated that did you ever get an amends from that person no i don't, still don't know who it was mm -hmm. it's not important mm -hmm. it was doing me a favor I didn't know that. Not important for you would be important for them if they're still sober, um, but that's a whole nother thing. That's well, I mean, uh, they all, the guy, that priest also told us one out of three of you, one year from now, one out of three of you will still be sober. The other two will be using. Right. And uh, so I'm sure that person, that person has had a, you know, has had an, uh, an interesting uh, path because that was, that was not, sober behavior that was not sobriety behavior <clears throat> doing whatever he did and i'm sure he got paid something by the inquirer they were paying well for those stories so so before we go back and move to your career uh how 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 has your recovery played out over these 35 four or five years um <laughs> uh what what's your daily practice gregory I, I mean i know that having values and following them is uh do you have a Do you have a spiritual practice? Mm -mm. I surf. Uh, that's my that's my religion, if I have one. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm very spiritual. Mm -hmm. I love I love nature, and I I love communing with nature and communing with people that that are close to me. And uh, in terms of sobriety, you know, I don't do meetings anymore. I did for. 10, 12, maybe a little longer years. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I don't want to be addicted to meetings any more than I want to be addicted to my drug of choice or any drug. So it's funny, you, as I got more secure in my sobriety and more sure of why I'm sober and why I want to be sober, mm -hmm. I think I'm doing a meeting every morning in the mirror. I think it takes about three seconds. I think I, I, I recognize a guy with a disease and I know that all I can control is what I do today. Mm -hmm. And that applies not just to sobriety, but to everything else too. So I just, I, I, it's so far, knock wood, so far, so good, you know? For 34 years, it, it hasn't been a real struggle for, for the last 25, mm -hmm. you know? Um, is there I, I, have, I, I can be around alcohol. I can be around people that are using. I, I have been not not on purpose, but mm -hmm. you can't control everything. So sometimes you just find yourself around people who are abusing, and mm -hmm. and I get out of there if I can. I you know I don't want to hang around with those people. I don't want to watch people self destruct. But mm -hmm. but by being around it, I'm not enticed at all, mm -hmm. at all. If anything, I think by being willing to do these meetings like I'm doing with you right now, mm -hmm. just talk openly and honestly about what the disease is and what it was to me and is to me. Um, I think that's helping others get sober. I, I think, I mean, look, I've, I've been very, I'm very proud in, in a humble sense. I'm proud that I have found my life back after being such an addict and have a family and a career. And I've had all these things that I, that I value very much and I'm proud of having re regained them, my health. But- uh, How has the conversation changed with you and Randy uh, since you uh, went from being that liar, cheater, stealer guy to being this guy who never tells a uh, I'm sure that had to impact your relationship in a tremendous way. That's terrible. I think it took two or three years of sobriety after I got out of Betty Ford's before she believed it. Mm -hmm. I mean, not enough, not, not, not that she didn't believe I wanted to be a good husband and I wanted right. to be sober and I wanted those things, but to believe that, no, it's real and it's, it's, it's solid mm -hmm. and I can count on it. Mm -hmm. I can trust it. I can quit being careful and weary or, or uh, wary of, of his promises uh, you know, or what he tells me, no, all he's telling me is the truth and all he's being is who he purports to be, you know. I think after a couple of years, she started to trust. And then our, our relationship became great. And then we had another kid, then another kid, and then another kid. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so you know. speaking of kids, let's talk about when you were a kid, because you had a very exotic uh, uh, growing up on Catalina Island. And from what I recall, your father is the guy of the glass bottom boat. Is that so? He was the captain of the glass bottom boat. He was the captain. In, Cat in, in Catalina. Um, the boat was a big paddle wheeler called the Phoenix in the summertime. That was the big boat. It carried a couple of hundred passengers, mm -hmm. like 12 big, or not 12, maybe, maybe six big boxes that would seat about uh, 20 people around each box. Mm -hmm. with thick glass on the bottom and you could look down and see wow. all the fish in the undersea gardens you know and he would describe all the fish they were passing over and tell tales you know with his microphone while people were, while he's just slowly moving the boat over all these different things my grandfather started the glass water boats his father uh, how, did, and, wait, how did they get to catalina island what, what brought them to catalina island well my grandfather ended up there in 1903 from Dublin, Ireland, he was about 21, 22 years old. Uh, the, the family story goes that he was uh, having an affair with his father's mistress in Dublin. And his father chased him with a, with a rifle, with a shotgun, chased him, chased him out of Dublin. And he got on a ship and worked as a, as a cook's mate, uh, a cook's assistant yeah. from, from Dublin to Newfoundland. And then from there started working as a lumberjack in, in uh, up in, in the forests of Upper Canada, and uh, and then worked his way down to New York. And he came down with some kind of arthritic problem. And they, the doctors in New York, 
said, uh, you need to go out west where it's dry and go to Arizona. That's, mm -hmm. I got in a train and went to Arizona and it didn't fix it. And people there said, no, you need the, the healing waters of the Pacific. And so it's like 1902, you know, so that he gets on a train and goes to the, goes to Redondo Beach and, and uh, swims in the ocean for a few days or weeks and, and uh, nah, nothing heals. He's still getting all, he's 22, 20 years, 23 years old and he's all wow. gnarled up and wow. nothing. And somebody says, no, no, it's not these waters. It's those waters, and that island out there, the Catalina waters are the healing waters. So he and a buddy get on a boat and go over to Catalina and they're living in a little tent city, which is all there was back then. And, uh, and he's there for a little while and he gets well. So who knows if it was the water or just the virus or whatever it was passed or whatever, but that's where he got well, that's where he stayed. And he had grown up in Dublin and no one learns to swim, you know, profoundly <laughs> in Dublin. Right, but he ended up he ended up swimming so much that uh, when he started the glass bottom rowboats, he would dive under the glass and feed the fish under the water and wave at the people, <laughs> while the millions of fish would be all around him eating out of his hands, and wave and then go to the next boat. There was like, you know, half a dozen boats, and he ended up after a couple of years of doing that, he would he he was he has a, I have a postcard of him. It's champion of champions. He's he held the world's record for free diving, uh, three minutes and forty eight seconds, wow. and without without coming up for a breath. Now, now I think it's like twenty minutes. You know, people can slow down their own heart rate and 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 everything, and slow their metabolism down. They perfected it, but at the time that was the world's record: three minutes and forty eight seconds. That's and he was he was proud of it. He was in this like wife beater bathing suit, you know, on the bow of the boat in this po in this postcard, you know. Uh, Eddie Harrison, champion of champions. Well, he became, you know, the the uh, sort of like the deputized person of from the L.A. Police Department in Catalina. And when, <coughs> excuse me, when Amy Semple McPherson dived off the the pier in in uh, Santa Monica in front of thousands of people and said, "I'm going to reappear in the desert, prove to you that I am the daughter of God." She was a famous evangelist, you know, radio evangelist. Mm -hmm. they, the police couldn't find her body after she jumped off the pier. So they sent over to Catalina to get my grandfather because he was he was uh, deputized. They said, get him over here. And they brought him over on a speedboat and he dove all, free, free dove all day among the pilings to find her body and couldn't find it. But he got slammed up against a piling. And that night he'd been taken back to Catalina. They thanked him and sent him back. And that night... Uh, my father, who was like 13 at the time, remembers waking up to the sound of his father moaning and uh, he had this terrible ache in his back and they, they, in the middle of the night, they took him down to that same speedboat and put him on it to take him across to, the, to a hospital in Long Beach or somewhere. Mm -hmm. And he died mid-channel oh, of peritonitis. His kidney exploded and poisoned his system. So wow. he died. So uh, uh, that was how he died at the age of 40. And, and my father was 13, I think. And, uh, and then a few weeks later, Amy Simpson McPherson reappeared in the desert. And a few weeks later after that, somebody, uh, you know, and it was to great acclaim and millions of her followers were all thrilled around the world. Um, she had pulled off her miracle and proven who she was. And, and uh, a few weeks later, somebody walked in, a guy walked into the Santa Monica Police Department and said, I'm, my name's such and such and I'm, I'm um, me and these two guys, and he named two guys. Says we had air hoses under the pier. We whisked her away when she jumped off the pier in front of thousands of people. And I took her. I drove her to Santa Cruz, and uh, we spent spent three weeks in a hospital, trist in a hospital in a hotel room, trysting. Um, and then she, and then I drove her out to the desert and Death Valley and dropped her off. That's why she was found out there by a passerby car, you know in her dusty robes. And he said, and so she just broke up with me and I'll, I'll, I'll testify against the bitch. Wow. And uh, so they held this big trial. It was like the OJ trial of the twenties. And oh, she was my. tried, she was tried for fraud, but also for manslaughter for my, for my grandfather. Wow. And uh, because he died searching for her. Wow. So, so, uh, 
she, the other two guys, of course, said they didn't know what he was talking about. And it was just a he said, she said kind of case. And so she was found innocent of the fraud. Therefore, there was no manslaughter. And, and uh, yeah, so that was that was the story. But interestingly enough, my father, it so affected him that that was in 1926. And in 19, 1970. Five, I did a play at the Callboard Theater on Melrose Place down by La Cienega and Melrose mm -hmm. and a little tiny 99 seat theater with John Allison who owned the theater and, and uh, Christopher Norris who ended up doing Trapper John with me a few years later. Mm -hmm. I did a little Russian drama there. It was my first play in Los Angeles when I'd gotten out of the army and started studying. And my father came to see the play and he, just before I went uh, to go on stage at eight o'clock, Somebody comes back to the little dressing room at this little theater and says, Greg, your father's out front and he needs to talk to you. I said, what are you, I'm, I'm about to go on stage. Tell him to just come on in and sit down. And he had come over from the island. And, uh, and finally, said, no, he's, he insists on seeing us. So I went out, I'm standing up. And I go, what, what, what do you need? And he said, oh, I can't come in. I said, what, what do you mean you can't come in? Come in, sit down, watch the play. He goes, I can't. This was Amy Semple McPherson's first theater. I can't go in. And it was like 50 years later, you can't even walk in the door because this was her, her, her church. Wow. This was her, this was her original church. Wow. So the little boy and my father still couldn't go in. Oh. Wasn't that touching? That, when yeah. I realized what it was about, it was like, yeah, it was just uh, still moves me, you know, and he came to every, that's the only thing he, that I ever did that he didn't see. Okay, I was going to ask that. Now, somebody very famous played your father, I seem to recall as well. Oh, uh, Arthur Godfrey. Yeah, he played he played the captain of the Glass Bottom Boat in the movie The Glass Bottom Boat with Rod Taylor and Doris Day. That was 1965. Oh and that was the movie, because it was on my dad's boat, they couldn't get rid of me. Uh, as I was such a pest on any set that was filming on the island, right? And then they would just like ban me from any anywhere within a hundred yards of the set. So that one they couldn't, because my it was my dad's boat, and I, <laughs> I had a place on that boat. And so I'd sit there about ten feet away from watching the two of them play scenes, and and that was the day that I knew that was what I was going to do with my life. You know, that was that was my my right turn from being the third generation Catalina glass bottom boat captain to you know going to Hollywood all right I'm in total frustration because I, I know that we that you have an appointment at 6 30 and I and we haven't even started on your career so uh, ah, my career so just give us a little because a song and dance man you've done a ton of theater Eileen Angel wants to know if you still write songs by the way she worked the merch counter at Steel Pier she's she's one of my uh Wow. And uh, one of my COVID crazies. Um, do you still write songs? And how did- I still you... have some of that merch from Steel Pier too. I bought it from her. I still have hats. Um, <laughs> and I, I had these bags made for our opening night, that, uh, these backpacks. I still have a couple. Fantastic. Yeah, I love that. I love doing that show. So how did, how did music come to, all right. I know, I know you played sports. I know you were a baseball, you, you played baseball in high school. Was it high school? Yeah, um, yeah. How did you, how did showbiz start? Did, did you, did you study song and dance? How did that happen? No, no, no. I was in the army. I was stuck in that little room. Uh, I'd been writing, my father was a poet and, and, and a published uh, all, poet. Aren't all Irishmen poets? Yeah, he was Irish. He had a bad temper and he wrote poetry. And, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Was he a and I started Gregory, writing wait, poetry. I started got, writing poetry. Wait, wait, I got to ask this question. Was your dad an alcoholic? Irish? No. no okay. Not at all. Okay. Sorry. I he, would have, he would have one gin and tonic uh, in the evening and that was it. Okay. Right. Um, never saw him drunk, ever. Uh, the alcoholism came from my mother's side. Not my mom, but her parents, her brother, everybody on her, my mother's side was, was alcoholic. Um, so what was I saying? Uh, uh, you were talking about how you got started oh, yeah. song and dance. No, yeah. no I, I started playing the guitar to put my poem because I'm sitting in this room by myself, uh -huh. you know, uh, 14 hours a day. Uh, so I bought a little guitar from a guy who was getting out for 30 bucks and I started, I learned how to play the guitar. 
in that year and a half. And I started putting songs that I, or poems I'd written to music and turning them into songs. And I started just writing songs. And, and when I came to Hollywood, I was, I'd, I'd go play my music at the Troubadour on Hootenanny night, you know, on Monday nights, you'd go stand in line in the afternoon and get your slot and then go up there and play. And I was always uh, hoping that I'd get some music producer to give me their card. I got a lot of cards, but unfortunately they were all for porn films. They weren't for, uh, <laughs> they weren't, they weren't for music producers. They were porn, porn producers who were going, that guy looks hungry. And uh, I'll, bet, I'll bet he'd be willing to do a porn movie, you know? And so they'd give me their card and I'd figure it out. And go. But uh, eventually when I wrote, uh, I created and produced for ladies only this movie about a male stripper, that was the story. I, I was always thinking, what if I had done a porn film? Would it haunt me? So I, so then when male strippers started to be a big thing, I went, okay, let's switch that to male stripping and see if that haunts me. And I'll do that movie. Let's make that movie. So I've that I, I sort of took a life experience, altered it slightly, and then then played it out on the screen. So how did you? How uh, we have like no time. How did you? We have time to hear this story. How did your career break? Well, you know, I, I, I studied from, on the GI Bill, I studied acting from 1971 until 1975 uh, at Estelle Harmon's Actors Workshop and then at Lee Strasberg and then at, with Stella Adler. But when I was at Estelle's, somebody came around in about 1974, they came and said, who, he said we wanna see who your best students are because um, we're gonna produce a little independent film. There's two kids and, they had $100,000 their father had, had given them to make a movie, and they had won some Super 8 contest at UCLA the previous year. They were 18 years old, these two guys. And so she said, oh, yeah, come on in, watch, watch our pro professional class. And by that time, I was in the professional class, even though I'd never worked, didn't have an agent. <clears throat> but I was doing good work. And uh, so they came in and watched it, and they watched one night, and they came and said, we want to offer you this starring role in our movie. And we're going to shoot for a year on weekends. Rent the, equipment, rent the equipment on a Friday night, take it back Monday morning, pay for one day's rental. We're gonna shoot continuously from Friday night until Monday morning and then take the week off and then start the next weekend. We're gonna shoot for a year. Um, are you interested in doing it? We can't pay you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> what else am I doing? I had a window washing route and that I, on Santa Monica Boulevard that I, would, that I had put together that would su sustain me. Uh, in the middle of the weeks, so, you know, so, so I said, sure. So we shot it for a year and it was called, uh, Jim, the world's greatest. And, um, and at the end of the year, they cut it together. And Charles Champlin was a times critic at the time. And he loved this movie and wrote a front page article in the calendar section about it and me. And he said, it's a feature film. Uh, possibility somebody should buy it. Sid Sheinberg read his article at Universal, bought it as a Universal release. We had to reshoot half of it. The, an agent called and said, are you represented? This guy's raving about you. I said, no, I don't have an agent. She said, would you like one? I said, yes, I would. And I got in the union because Universal reshot half of it. So it was like all the, the catch 22s got turned over all at once. And the next thing you know, I've got $40 in the bank and I'm only going in on starring roles in feature films. Wow. 19, 1976, I guess this was, by the time that film was done shooting and cut together. It was, it was 1976, and I'm like an overnight success with no money, wow. but I am an overnight success. And, uh, and so it was like I so totally skipped that section of the career where you're supposed to like do bits and, <laughs> and, and build your way up to lead roles and stuff. I just went from nothing for five years to the good roles, you know? So have, I'll take I'll take that, it was fine. It was a kind of a, but then again, I came East to Hollywood. So, you know, everybody else goes West to Hollywood. So, <laughs> so I have a backwards career in all senses, you know? And then I worked my, I started in feature films, worked my way into television and then bought a theater and started doing real theater, you know, and then ended up on Broadway eventually 20 years after I started having success as a TV actor. Film well, okay, so I, my, I, I get this is gonna be my last question because we're out of time. What, what's it like the first time you walk out on a Broadway stage? What was your first Broadway, your first Broadway role? Steel Pier, Steel Pier. Okay, so now 
what is that experience? You've, you've done, you've had this whole huge career. You're already a star, but I imagine it feels different when you walk out on a Broadway stage for the first time. Oh, it's all different. And doing Broadway was, doing theater, you know, I love anyway, but doing Broadway was, you know, it was like, instead of being some kind of a big shot, you just run as fast as you can to try and keep up with the talent that's around you. It's just, it's just relentless talent going on at all times. And if you lose focus or drop the ball for one instant, you're, you're a mile behind. Wow. And, and that I loved. I loved that. You know, they say that a tennis player, you want to play with someone who's better than you. You know, you want to, someone who keeps you learning and growing. Mm -hmm. And you can get really lazy doing television and doing and working and in, uh, you know, in, in easy, easy projects with, with moderately talented casts. I mean, it's all fine. I love the business. I love, I love what I do, but mm -hmm. I want to get better. I still think I can get better. I still think I can get better. And I know I can get better. <clears throat> and I still think I'm better than I was five years ago. Uh, um, I, don't get I, many opportunities, don't get many opportunities to prove it, but I, I, and now and then I do, you know, I did, I, I, I told you, I did uh, Nine, one. Uh, a lion, the Lion in Winter. Oh yeah, uh, that's a special. Down at, down at Laguna Playhouse in December of last year. So like literally a couple of weeks before the pandemic started, I closed that show and, and uh, with, with Francis Fisher and I doing the, the uh, Peter O'Toole and Catherine Hepburn roles. It was, two and a half hours of just heavy dialogue and, and okay, wait, most demanding, wait, most demanding wait, I, role I've ever done and the most rewarding. I have to ask you, how at this stage of life do you learn your lines? Come on, how do you, do you have a trick? No, that's, I, I was wondering, how am I gonna learn my lines? How am I gonna do this? Uh -huh. I, and somehow I did, I don't know how. I, I, I just, it required, you know, if I if I did if I had one tenth the discipline as a high school student that I had learning lines for the Lion in Winter, um, I'd have been a much better student. Mm -hmm. I I am so much more disciplined now and determined to 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 get where I need to get than I ever did then. You know I have to work harder, but I'm but I know that the reward is worth it. So I don't ever I don't mind it. You know I don't mind working hard. I don't mind focusing my whole life around it for a period of time. Okay, so I'm lying again because I have one more question. So right now you're doing your first soap opera. How how is that's like a you have to work like a maniac on a soap opera. How, how is that? For well, you? that's a real challenge too. You get 20, 30 pages of dialogue each day, you know, and that night you go home and you're just. Oh. But and I, and that's probably why I never I never did. I've been offered soaps, huge huge arcs in in soaps with lots of money involved. Yeah. for 30 years and and I've always said mm, no no and I you know I always my oh soaps that's where that's where good actors go to die and oh and I made all these excuses what it really was was I was just afraid that I couldn't handle it that, that it just scared me to death well the pandemic eight months of not working and wondering is it business ever going to get back to hiring you again made me willing to listen to this uh, approach, uh, asking me if I'd be interested in coming in and do, doing General Hospital, working with Kim Delaney, playing my, my wife and, uh, and this huge cast that wonderful people I've come to know, I've come to discover. And, uh, and I, somehow I, I said yes. And uh, I've never been more terrified than those first few days. But now it's kind of like, oh, no, I can do this. I can do this. I just know it's, it's a process. Trust, trust, trust yourself. You'll get there. Mm -hmm. You get these words two, three days in advance. Um, start, start the process, get familiar, get familiar, get today's, familiar with tomorrow's, slightly familiar with the next days. And then as each one unfolds, you know, clear the hard drive. A have, you, bit. have you ever hit a wall? Uh, like, have you ever like just blanked and not? Have, have has that happened? Yeah, but 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 it there. It's not Shakespeare. So so if as long as you know what you're trying to say, you can usually right. get by with that, you know. And right. if it's really terrible or you just really go blank dead, 
they can stop and start again, but they don't want to. They don't like to. They don't. Have, they're shooting 110 pages a day. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. 110 right. a day. I, I need one more minute of your time because if I don't ask you this question, I will never be forgiven. Trapper John, just give us highlights. What? I mean, that that's a that's a life changer for you, a game changer in every way. Um, was it a wonder? I mean, what what, what was that? For, how how'd you get Trapper John? How did that happen? Um, you know, I was the first one cast, and uh, I, I screen tested with all the all the guys who wanted to come in to play Trapper. So it was it, it wasn't that hard. I mean, they 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 apparently all agreed on me, and then they went out hunting for the rest of the cast. So uh, I it was my seventh pilot that I had screen tested for that year. Oh my god. And I'd come in second six times. Wow. There are no accidents, there are no mistakes, right? You know, it's just I I some people would have looked at that and said, I'm just jinxed. I can't. I, I you know, six second places, uh mm -hmm. I you know, I'm I'm never gonna get there. And but I looked at it and said you know, I'm no gamble. I'm not, I, I don't go to Vegas, but I know that the odds are in my favor now. Right. You know, first of all, the other six guys that look like me are already employed. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I've got to be due. And, and I was, you know, um, I had, I'd, 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 I'd had uh, Logan's run a couple of years before that, you know, for one season. Mm -hmm. And then I did Centennial in between those two, and that was 25 sisters. hour minutes. Sisters, sisters, that's sisters is where I fell in love with you. So oh sisters. Yeah, I killed George Clooney in that show. <laughs> Not everybody can say that. I freed George Clooney to go become a huge star on ER. <laughs> you did. With, um with uh Celia Ward. Celia Ward and I. These yeah. guys were so hot together. Uh, yeah. I swore before I, I posted the picture of us from the last time you were here and said there's a story behind it. And I actually I didn't remember it until I listened for a second. Do you remember uh, the last time you were here, Al Franken had got had had to resign because of grabbing ass. And that's what that yes. picture was. We were Frankening. Um, oh, but right. Was, yes, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. That, yeah. Well, Are you going to show it and have it come back and haunt me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, but anyway, Gregory, thank you so, so, so much. I, I, I always adore talking with you. We made a movie together. I I was the scenery, but you were the star. But the uh, Henry Jaglum's the M word. So that's how I met you. So wonderful. Yeah. So, and, thank and, you so much. I, I, I love doing this. And uh, I guess we have to wait another four years before I can come back and do it again. Absolutely huh? not. I'm going to be I'm going to be knocking on your door soon. And I just want to say a word out there um, that I'm kind of heartbroken today. Uh, we've lost Cloris Leachman. Did, did, uh, you, did you ever meet Cloris? Did you ever work with Cloris? I did. In fact, uh, uh, Morgan, her son, was in a picnic that I did at the Amundsen. And so I, I met Cloris when she came to see Morgan do that show with us. Wow. And with Rue, Rue McClanahan and Michael Learned mm -hmm. and and wow. Dick Van Patten and just this this a tremendous cast and uh, wow. yeah and I met her then and of course I I fell in love with her on uh, the Last Picture Show and then all the comedy the Young Frankenstein my favorite movie of all time I, I tell the story on my Facebook today of everything you just mentioned uh, fits into my I got to watch um, the Last Picture Show with her at Phil Rosenthal's movie night. Oh. Uh, oh. and she when she did women who write she stayed in character as frau blucha the entire time <laughs> only with me only with me his funny yeah gregory thank you so much i i really am gonna i i really am gonna have beg you to come back so that we can have more showbiz stories because you're a fabulous storyteller amazing and i for you and respect you and admire you and thank you vicky uh, thank you so much for for um for sharing yourself with us today it's my pleasure great. my pleasure i loved it thank you see you soon bye everybody okay. bye